Oops, I don't know if I need that one. Okay, so let me pull up the PowerPoint for today. So we're going to talk about um, res um, respiratory diseases and medications. So there's no guest speaker for this. So I'm just include everything, the medications and the, um, the diseases. And let me just get it on the... And I want to show you guys a few things um, to help you with studying these PowerPoints. For quizzes and exams. Okay, so when you look at, when you go through, I'm just going to go through this quickly for um, just for a second and then I'll and then we'll start over. But as you look through the PowerPoint, I uploaded a new one this morning into Moodle. It should be the, um, the right one. I tried to triple check it was. So if you notice, I'm going to just highlight things as we go through the PowerPoint. Um, so like this is, this, this is highlighted, these are highlighted, this is highlighted. So these are all, but then also notice how these drugs are, are highlighted. So notice how Flonase is highlighted and before on the previous slide, Sudafed and things like that. Those are the ones that you're going to want to study but out of this PowerPoint, make a table and put everything on the table that is, um, that is the, the red highlighted medication. Those are medications you do want to be really familiar with. They likely will show up on a quiz or exam, not that 100% of them will, but they're also super common and they have side effects that affect the oral cavity. You're going to see them all the time. You might be taking them yourself. You know, so these are drugs you really want to be more intimately familiar with. Um, so some of them are read like that. Um, pathophysiology of asthma, that includes this slide and this slide. So that's important for a quiz or an exam. Um, this uh, intermittent, persistent, moderate, persistent, this is important for an exam. So I'm trying to like give you guys, it's kind of like what Professor um, Yaffe does in hers is she kind of bolds the stuff you guys really need to know. So I was, um, I was trying to go through and do that for you. Um, not that I want you to just focus in on that stuff because that's not always, you know, hundred percent, but that will give you some really good focus. Between that and the study guides, you should have a really focused um, of what to, uh, of what. okay, I'm gonna go all the way back to the beginning and we'll look at respiratory diseases. There's a couple of really good videos. I'm not gonna play just for time's sake, but there's the Khan Academy. Have you guys ever seen that before for, I don't even that might even be like a high school thing but boy do they describe things really just nice and like easy to comprehend so i put in a couple um two, there's two different khan academy videos and i think there's one embedded in the slide deck the powerpoint has some other um videos that i couldn't get to work on my computer but my computer was acting funny yesterday so you'll have to let me know if the links are not working anymore i may have to get new links these are the objectives for this um, lecture. Identify the function and anatomy of the respiratory system. Um, discuss allergic rhinitis, asthma, COPD. Um, we're gonna talk specifically about the anatomy and the a function of the conditions. Etiology, you never really have to know too much etiology. That's not usually on an, on an exam. I mean, it's there, it's nice to know, it's important, it's important to kind of understand prevalence and things like that, but it's not, it's not usually um, exam questions that I really focus on. Pathophysiology and then the complications, identify drugs which treat rhinitis, asthma, COPD, um, their therapeutic effects, a lot of mechanism of action. That's a, something that is going to come around a lot on a lot of the different units is understanding the mechanism of action. Um, so making sure that that's in your kind of study charts or your you know um, study cards or whatever you do. And then adverse effects, especially if it's oral. If it's 
xerostomia, if it's an increased risk of um, uh, candidiasis or oral thrush, if it's um, sloughing or burning of the tissue, if it, you know, anything like that, just assume you have to remember that. I mean, just automatically assume that's important to remember. So we'll go over the um, lung anatomy here in a very simplified way. Um, so air is taken in through the nasal cavity. So we breathe in the air, it travels down um, past the pharynx and into the trachea and into our lungs. And then our lungs branch off into all these divisions and they end um, in the alveoli. And we have, I think like millions of alveoli. I, I mean, I don't know if you could Google it, how many alveoli do we have? But it, um, there's tons and tons and tons of these little sacs. Um, so the airways are surrounded by smooth muscle. Um, which receptors can you guys think of? Um, this is gonna just, a lot of these alpha, beta, they kind of come back with a lot of these medications because a lot of them work on these different receptors. So which receptors can you think of from previous chapters that are related to smooth muscle in the lung? I heard beta two, yep, mm -hmm. beta two is a big one. Um, yeah, and then when the muscles are stimulated, this, this statement, I'm like back and forth, I, I sat and I, and I looked and I remembered last year, I was like, I don't like this statement. Um, and I look at it and I think about it and I look at it in the text and it kind of drives me a little bit crazy because it kind of goes against what I feel like I think I know, but I left it in there and I think it has to do with how, how the functions of the receptors work and what they do. And so I think the next slide helps to kind of clarify it. But in the text, it has this, when the muscles are stimulated, they contract narrowing the lumen. And you don't have to know this for an exam. This isn't on an exam question. Um, so it's narrowing the opening um, of the airway. So I think that is basically talking of, about, you know, things when uh, we have bronchoconstriction, that stimulation is, I think, what it's, but it's just a very, I feel like it's, they don't add much explanation around that statement. And when you think of like breathing in and stimulating your lungs, I don't know, I don't think about things closing up. So I'm, I'm like, why don't they expound on that statement a little bit more? It's just like a bullet that they just leave in the textbook. Um, but I think this kind of helps a, maybe kind of explain it a little bit more. So this, this whole chart's really, important for you guys to um, be familiar with. And just keep referring back to this to remind yourself of what all these receptors do. Cause this kind of is a nice summary of all of it. So alpha one receptors, um, they do have an effect on the lungs for smooth muscle contraction. So this could have something to do with that stimu stimulation of the, of the muscle causes a narrowing of the lumen. So that statement that that um, was in the previous slide. So it could be when, when these receptors are stimulated and I could be reading into it too much, but it kind of driving me crazy. Um, but vasculature, so constriction of um, blood vessels. So that's alpha one. Beta two is very important with medications. With the lungs, we have um, stimulation of the beta two receptor gives bronchodilation. Stimulation of beta two on the heart gives cardiac contraction increases contractility. And then with the vasculature, if beta two is stimulated, we have vasodilation. Alpha one is where epinephrine works a lot on, ep, um, on alpha one. And that's why we get that good vasoconstriction around the area where we give the injection, because we have a lot of it. Some of it works on beta two for the, the vasodilation, but more of it goes to alpha one. That's why you get good um, vasoconstriction with epinephrine. Then we have a new one, H1, and H1 on the lungs, it has to do with bronchoconstriction. So when um, H1 is activated, um, we have um, bronchoconstriction, bronchial mucosal, um, mucus secretion and congestion. So all these things, so we have a lot of H blockers. Those are a lot of the medications that we use are gonna block the H1 receptor, because see, you notice all these things that are going on with the lungs with H1, bronchoconstriction, we don't really want that. 
mucus secretion and congestion. You don't want a lot of that in your lungs. So that's when this is activated. So a lot of medications will be more like blocking that one. Vasculature, nasal mucosal secretion, um, congestion, hives, and edema. So again, antihistamines, thinking of all of these things that happen when you have an allergic reaction or a rhinitis kind of thing. So blocking H1 is, is what a lot of medications do. Um, eyes, localized vasodilation, redness. People use those eye drops um, to get rid of uh, red eye, doing, um, um, doing the opposite of this, obviously it's blocking it and then it's causing um, vasoconstriction in the eyes, get rid of the red eyes. And then leukotrienes, um, when they're activated, there's bronco, um, bronchoconstriction. So there's medications that block or modify leukotrienes to help with vasodilation, doing the opposite. Do you have a question, Lex? Yeah. yeah. Vasculature. So it's just the little tiny blood vessels in whatever part of the body. So it's blood vessels. Yeah. Yeah. So this is just, I like this chart because I just feel like it has kind of a lot of stuff that you need to know for this um, unit. Okay, so we're gonna talk about these three conditions, uh, rhinitis, asthma, and COPD. So the prevalence of rhinitis, um, it's pretty, pretty common. There was a different, if anybody happened to look at the PowerPoint that before I updated it, it said something like 54% of Americans basically have some kind of seasonal allergy, which I wouldn't be surprised. But then I went to like an actual like, allergy association website, like the official allergy and asthma. And it said more than 50 million Americans are living with nasal allergies. And about half of those have seasonal pollen allergies. Well, 50 million Americans is not a half because there's like what, 330 million in America or something. So, so I didn't know, you know, I just thought, well, that was more current. So I, but really, I feel like that's an underestimation. I feel like a ton of people have allergies. So who knows, it's not really important in the way that you'll be tested on it, but interesting to note, men are more likely than women to have allergies. Allergies are on the rise 10 to 30% in the US. If you have an interest in this, there's a lot of really interesting data about how much allergies increased starting in about the 80s. I mean, the amount of like allergies just kind of went whew, and that's just what happened. So it's interesting to look at that data and then kind of wonder why. Um, so etiology, so um, some common allergens include pollen, mold, dust, uh, grasses, ragweed, pet dander. So there's all kinds, people smoke, perfumes, different things, people can be allergic to all sorts of stuff. Um, viral rhinitis or the common cold um, presents with many of the same symptoms but of course it's uh, triggered by a virus, not by um, an allergen or an irritant in that, in that um, sort of way. The rhinovirus is the most common, but there's other common ones um, such as lots of different coronaviruses, adenoviruses, or the RSV, the respiratory um, um, syndicial virus, I said that wrong. Um, so typically they haven't, you know, there's really no prevention or like cure for the common cold. Yeah, everybody knows that. Um, however, there is a lot of really good research on high dosing vitamins, especially not high dosing zinc, but high dosing some other vitamins. But specifically with zinc, um, there is some peer reviewed clinical trial evidence that if you take zinc on, on the onset, like the second you get any kind of a uh, idea that you are coming down with a cold um, and you take it um, at, you know, however much it's like in one study, they, I think it was something like 13 milligrams. And I'm not sure how many, how often they did it throughout the day, but it can um, shorten the duration of a cold. And that's been like, they've done that study over and over again. And that does seem to be, and that's why they've done stuff like marketed Zycam and things like that, which is just zinc because they're like, oh, you know, and I think it works, but you have, it's timing related. It's really, really super timing related, but there's no vaccine for um, viral 
rhinitis because there's just too many um, viruses. There's hundreds of viruses and they mutate and there's just no way to nail that down for a vaccine. Okay. Um, so this is um, something that you guys are gonna wanna know about mast cells. So when uh, someone's having an allergic reaction, we have these mast cells in our bodies all the time. And inside of these mast cells, there's histamine. So inside of this little globule cell is stored a bunch of histamine. And histamine is important because it has a protective effect in certain circumstances, just like anything. But if it, but um, with an allergic reaction, your body just kind of overreacts to it. So what happens is like a, um, some pollen comes in and it attaches itself to these um, allergy antibodies, these little Y-shaped protrusions on the mast cell. And your body kind of goes, oh my goodness, there's this thing I got to protect. And it releases all this histamine. Um, and so then you get um, the runny nose, you get the watery, itchy eyes, you get the congestion. Um, and that's all because of the histamine that's released from the mast cell. So here's a video. I'm not going to play it, but you guys can. It might be the same one that's in Moodle. It's just in the, the lineup of other. Okay. So signs of rhinitis, nasal congestion, runny nose, itching, sneezing, mucus production, you know, all of that. We've all experienced plenty of that in the recent years. Um, so treatment for allergic rhinitis, um, obviously to avoid the allergens if you can. So some people, you know, can't have animals and things like that, or um, they can't, my coworker, she couldn't have a Christmas tree. She was so allergic to fur and she couldn't have a real Christmas tree. Um, even just walking into a place for a short time, she would just totally like poof up and runny nose and stuffy, it was crazy. And then, um, so, and then there's also, there's medications that you can take. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so, what do you use to treat cold symptoms? Can you guys think of what, you know, typically you might take to treat a cold? Lemon and ginger, I know. I always go to the natural stuff too. That's what I use too. What about in the cold and flu aisle? What would, what would some people use to treat a cold? Um, ibuprofen, Tylenol, sure. But think mucinex, mucinex, anything else? Dayquil, Nyquil, did someone say Sudafed? They hear Sudafed, yeah, Sudafed. Um, then there's also uh, Claritin, Zyrtec, Allegra, all of that for allergies. You're not gonna use that for a viral cold, right? But you would use that if you know you're suffering from allergies. What would you absolutely not take for viral rhinitis? What would absolutely not work? It would, what, antibiotic? Yes, antibiotic. There's no reason to take an antibiotic with a, um, with a virus unless you have a secondary infection, which is possible. So, but in general, you don't go for that. Um, okay, so there's a couple families of drugs. Um, there's a question here on the study guide that asks, um, it says four types of medications to treat allergic rhinitis. And so that's this slide here. And that are, is your mass cell stabilizers or blockers who are blocking the mass cells so that we don't get that release of the histamine. We have our antihistamine, so we're blocking the H1 receptor. And then we have our decongestants, and they do a couple different things, different mechanisms, but they um, usually have to do with vasoconstriction in the nose and things like that to help with all that buildup and open things up. And then we have our calm things down, which are our um, corticosteroids. Yeah? Um, well, inadvertently. So it's like a step ahead. So the mass stabilizer, it's, it's where the body's sort of blocking the reaction of the mass cell. And then inside the mass cell is the histamine. So by default, the histamine doesn't get released, but you're blocking the mass cell. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important for you guys, what do you think the main reason we, that anyone takes a steroid or a corticosteroid for any reason? Inflammation. So it's important for you guys to think of that in lots of different applications, because that medication is going to come back through lots of different um, conditions that people have. 
anytime there's a lot of inflammation, uh, a steroid or um, a corticosteroid is going to be a, one of the main drugs. It's, it's a common drug. It's been used for eons. And so they use it whenever there's inflammation out of, out of control. So that's really important for you guys to um, remember. But there are side effects with excess use of that too. So we have to kind of be aware of those. So mass stabilizers, um, so the use to prevent and treat symptoms, um, the mechanism of action is it, it's blocking, it's preventing the mast cell from releasing in the first place, which like we just said, therefore the downstream of release of histamine won't happen. It's a slower uptake of the, the medication um, going to work. It's a slower uptake. So it's gonna be one to two weeks. So that's not gonna be an immediate like, um, relief at all. Um, adverse effects is just kind of nasal burning and stinging and also red headaches too. Some, that was another one that another source um, said. And then med medications would be this um, chromalin sodium or the nasal chrom is, the, is a mass cell. And are we still talking about the allergy? We are still talking about probably more allergy related, yeah. But nasal chrom, I think people would take that even with a viral. I don't think that's just allergies. That's just, although I've never taken that drug, but it, this has to do with your, your mast cell. So it's probably more with the allergy. Okay, so antihistamines um, are the next group. And this is you, um, to prevent or treat the symptoms of the nasal, you know, nasal congestion, watery eyes, all that stuff. Um, and how this works is this blocks the histamine from binding to an H1 receptor. So when the histamine is released from the mast cell, this prevents it from um, adhering to an H1 receptor in your nose and you know, in your eyes or wherever it is, wherever it's gonna caught, kind of wreak its havoc, this medication is gonna block it. So it's a blocker, histamine blocker. First generation versus second generation. It's important for you guys to remember this. There's two different generations. The first generation obviously being the one that they first discovered, um, but it has, it's effective, very effective, but it has more side effects. Um, and so that's the big difference between first generation and second. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple slides, um, but equal anti-allergy efficacy. So this works quite, both of them work quite well, um, but like I said, one, this one has more side effects. Um, it's quick onset, it works, um, pretty fast, but there's several adverse effects. So xerostomia being a huge one that's applicable to us, and then the anticholinergic side effects. So that's the blood is the, the um, acronym there, and it's limits salivation, so or reduces, you could say reduces salivation, lacrimation, urination, and defecation. Those are, those are all anticholinergic side effects. So in general, if it, if it ever comes up on a test, you know, what are anticholinergic side effects? Then that's, it reduces all of that stuff that produces like, you know, lubrication or excreting anything that, you know, is somewhat, anyways, I don't know. I don't need to go into detail with that. But basically when you think of like dry eyes and dry mouth, um, and then you can't pee and you can't poop, that's the, um, the pharmacy guy has a funnier, um, he'll probably, it might be in one of the upcoming guest speakers, get a funnier way of describing it. Um, so drowsiness and sedation, um, that, that um, varies and it's more common with the first generation. So here's a breakdown of the first and second generation. Benadryl, you guys, has everyone taken Benadryl before? Pretty common, it's kind of like, you all know what that, that, that's all you really have to remember. Benadryl is a first generation antihistamine and everybody probably who's had any kind of experience with it knows that it can make you sleepy and it can kind of dry you out and things like that. Second generation is a little bit more, but um, um, lorantadine or Claritin, Zyrtec and Allegra, um, all of these have low um, sed um, sedation um, effects and then lower or low anticholinergic effects. So all of these tend to be far more popular than Benadryl. Yeah. How does this 
question in which to ask you this twice. So for the anti-terrorist Palestinian in general, it's been called here but it's mm -hmm. uh, an anti-colonial anti-colonergic. Mm -hmm. It causes uh, an increase in mortality. No decrease. So xerostomia um, is an anticholinergic effect. It's just that we always we always separate xerostomia because it comes up so often with so many medications. And those medications might not be um, working in that system. They, they, might, they might not be necessarily working in that system, or they may be, but we always separate xerostomia out. But xerostomia and the, the, the S for salivation are the same thing because so you're decreasing salivation. Um, all these the salivation muscles Urination and mm -hmm. are those uh, being decreased? Decreased. Okay. Decreased. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Base, I mean, if I don't know that you have to remember it that way, it's because that's not really, it's a histamine blocker. So, but it has anticholinergic effects. Yeah. Yeah, those little Y-shaped things coming off of it, those were it's the allergy antibodies. And that's what the pollen or whatever attaches to that sets that whole system off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where was I? I hadn't gotten to this one yet. Have I? No, okay. Um, so decongestant, this is, um, so this is working more on the sympathetic nervous system here, because this is a sympathomimetic drug. So that's different from the, anti the um, cholinergic drug. So, um, and that's not necessarily something that's on a quiz. So that's more just kind of in parentheses. I didn't highlight it. You don't have to Feel like you have to memorize which ones are cholinergic and which ones are sympathomimetic, that sort of thing. Um, so the uses of a decongestion is to treat symptoms. The mechanism of action is that it's constricting, it's um, constricting the mucus secretion um, and the vasoconstriction in the nose to help um, reduce this super runny, just kind of everything's um, overreacting in the nasal cavity. And so it's working on the alpha one receptor. And so it's an adrenergic, um, which is an adrenergic receptor. So this is working on this receptor. Um, you have an adverse effect again with decongestants of xerostomia. You can have stinging, burning, um, nasal mucosa, dryness, um, all topically related. And then you can have with some of them, um, and that makes more sense when you think of Sudafed because you think of like ephedrine and you think of all the things that kind of go along with that category. People used to, you know, they've like outlawed some of those drugs because people can make like um, illegal drugs with them and it can make people's heart race and things like that. So that's all part of that same category. So that's why it can cause the negative effects of the increased blood pressure and the heart rate. Um, and then in the short term, um, you can, you want to only use it in the short term. And this is important. I should have highlighted this. You, you guys should, um, maybe highlight this yourself since I didn't, but, uh, some of these decongestant medications, if you use them too often, then you can have a rebound. So really it's important. Like if you're going to use it, just use it in the short term. Um, and for small, a small time, because you could, you could get relief, your nose could dry up and you're like, Oh, I can breathe again. But then if you use it too often, then it could just totally rebound and you get all plugged up and it stops working and it doesn't do its job anymore. So it's better to use these kind of medications in um, sparingly. Is mm -hmm. that when they say like, um, don't take a lot from that medication, medication because once you take a lot, your body would start uh, to get used to the medication? Yeah, I don't know if it's like a tolerance thing specifically because some medications are like tolerance buildup. This they describe as more of just a rebound. So I don't know, it, I mean, if it technically is a tolerance, but with some of these drugs like Afrin or some of these, um, maybe even Mucinex has a medication in it. So I know that some of them have different ingredients. 
But if you use something locally, uh, decongestant locally, too much, it can stop working. I think even is one of them. Is one of them? Yeah, because I experienced this myself. Mm -hmm. At first, it used to work for some objects, and then now I'm like, I'm taking it, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything, yeah. So I don't know if it's like you've built up a tolerance to it or if it's some other mechanism, but it cannot work after a while. So that's, that's no fun. So yeah, so they say really just short-term use. So here's some of the medications. So the ones um, that you really, I should update it and see where Mucinex falls in this because I know that uh, is a common one. You see it commercials and stuff for it. So I should probably update this. But um, Sudafed or Sudafed um, PE prolonged, what does PE stand for? I'm not sure, but either one, these are over the counter. But a lot of times you have to get these drugs um, from the pharmacist. You can't just go into the aisle and pick up a bottle of Sudafed like you could when I was a kid because people were hate using that to make meth or something. And so it's a controlled, um, it's, a con it's a precursor to methamphetamines. So it's a controlled substance, I think, in Oregon. So you have to ask the pharmacist for it. Yeah. Oh, did they? Yeah. It's back again? Oh, yay. Yay, I can make math. No, just kidding. Just kidding. That's so interesting, though. Well, now I have to update my thing. Because you all know I have a big old chemistry lab in my basement. Yeah. This back. That's so weird to me. Like, why would you go to all the trouble of taking it off the shelves if it was a problem? And then you're like, yeah, not a problem anymore. And then you put it back. I just, I think all of these policies sometimes drive me bonkers. Okay. Phenylephrine. Oh, well, that makes sense. There it is right there. Phenylephrine. Okay. And then this is pseudo ephedrine, pseudo ephedrine. And that's where you get pseudofed. Phenylephrine. Okay. Um, yeah, Max. Um, yeah. Oh, on the other side, let me see. Oh, sympathomimetics. That's just the kind of the category of drugs. So that works more on the sympathetic nervous system. So all of, like the, um, the alpha and beta, remember, because with the um, cholinergic, we have like the muscarinic and the nicotinic, and it's more the parasympathetic. So this is just saying that that's sort of what these work on more, but you don't have to really know that. Don't get too hung up on that for an exam or quiz. Okay, so intranasal corticosteroids. So Flonase is a very popular one. That's over the counter. It used to be prescription. Now it's over the counter. Then they have these other formulations that are prescription. These are used to treat, again, um, just inflammation in the nasal cavity. Um, and then um, it inhibits mast cells and the mediators. So leukotriene, prostaglandins, histamine, it kind of um, inhibits all of these different things. Um, and then time to relief, it can, I guess, take a couple of days to really start working and you can have adverse effects of stinging and burning, dryness of the nasal mucosa. So here's just a little, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I think they work pretty quickly. I know I noticed that that actually wasn't really there, but I think that the deep, congestants, it doesn't say, does it? Um, but just from personal experience, I think they work rather quickly. And I was looking at other, um, just other resources in like the, um, in the textbook and stuff. And it just, it doesn't really say, so I don't think there's probably ever going to be a quiz question on it. Like how much? The biggest one to know is that the mast cells tend to be slower um, to actually work on the mast cell. It's more of like a couple of weeks. Everything else I think works within days, at maybe like immediate relief or within a couple of days of using it. So they tend to just all work faster than the mast cell stabilizers. Okay. Back to, and then this here is a, um, is just a, a chart for you. It says quiz, like it's 
some kind of a like a quiz you have to take right now, but it's just um, sort of a uh, something that you can use to kind of help yourself at some point. Um, look at that and, tr and try to see how familiar you're getting once you kind of go through and study a little bit. How familiar am I getting with loratadine? How with um, the um, with the different medications and how to say mechanism of action. I actually changed that and then it must not have got saved. I hate that when I notice that I, it makes me nervous that something got messed up with the version. But I changed, I had meant to change that how to mechanism of action. That's basically what it means. And then adverse effects, um, focusing on your um, oral adverse effects. So you just go through at some point and you, you can kind of use that as a study guide as well. Okay, and then, so here's just a little, um, like a little case study here. So a 28 year old female is returning for a routine dental cleaning. Um, a few days ago, she came down with a cold. Her symptoms include watery and itchy eyes, sneezing and nasal congestion. She doesn't have any coughing, aching, fever or chills. She's been taking Benadryl every four to six hours as instructed on the box. It helped her itchy, watery eyes and sneezing, but she feels tired, kind of zoned out. She's still congested and has not been getting quality sleep. Um, she breathes through her mouth and believes it's why her mouth is so dry. So explain why Benadryl helped her itchy, watery eyes, but not her nasal congestion. So what, why could that be true? Yeah, it's blocking some of the symptoms, but then some of her other symptoms aren't being affected by the antihistamine. So what, why might that be? But yeah, some, most of, oh, I'm sorry, what? Right, so maybe she has like an actual, maybe she has a virus, right? So if she's starting to get some relief, but not total relief, she probably actually has a viral rhinitis. Um, which drug may be better for relieving her nasal congestion? Yeah, Sudafed or um, one of those other nasal decongestants, since it's not really um, necessarily just the histamines. Um, what may be causing her dry mouth? She thinks it's just because she's mouth breathing, but what might be causing her dry mouth? Her Benadryl, yeah. So the anticholinergic effects of the Benadryl. And then what drug may be better for relieving her itchy, watery eyes and sneezing that would cause less dry mouth? Think first generation, second generation. Yeah, so set so Claritin, Zyrtec, Allegra, she get relief there for her itchy, watery eyes without being so sleepy. Yeah, Brandon. Well, the case is that when a person has itchy, watery noses, mm -hmm. they also take decongestant. They may need to. Uh, yeah, because they work on different things. So they technically could if they felt like they were actually helpful. Like if they were, yeah, if they were actually helpful. Because like, they kind of work, yeah, they do different things. So they could take an out, like a Claritin for, or a Benadryl. Um, I don't think so many people take Benadryl. I think people have Benadryl to give to their kids to get them to go to sleep, which I have never done, by the way. But um has anyone done that? Because I'm terrified to do that. But I, <laughs> do you? I have known so many people who have done that. And I'm just like, I, I have a thing of liquid Benadryl because I was going to go on a, we went on a plane ride. And so I was like, I'm giving this to Lola. And I never did because I was like, what if she has a bad reaction on the plane? Well, who has a reaction to Benadryl? Probably yeah. nobody, but I'm just such a worry yeah. wart. But you're like, it works. <laughs> Knocks you out. What, Jenny? I don't know. That's what I thought. I thought, what if I give it to her and she's like, that has some crazy like bounces around. But other moms have said, give them Benadryl, put them to sleep. So I don't know. Okay. Um, so let's go on here. So now we're gonna, okay, let's take a little break and then we'll talk about asthma and COPD. So let's just take a five minute, um, just a quick stretch and bathroom break and come back at 940. <laughs>
Or do you just need to be familiar? Like, oh, this is the name for it. I just well, oh, that's gonna bring it's a good, good question, and I don't remember the because some of these exams have been around for a while. Yeah. So I try to look over the exams when I'm looking over the material, so I know what to kind of say. Pay attention to this. Pay attention to that. Um. So I don't know 100. percent I what I do know is that some of these medications, the brand name is so much more commonly used, used yeah. that it's just like the generic just doesn't, unless it's really um, gone into that where it's um, where it's uh, out of patent and it's been around forever and people are really familiar with both the generic and the brand, but you know, not all drugs are that way. That's right. So like loratadine, I've gotten a prescription for loratadine before. It's like, what's loratadine? Oh yeah, that's right, Claritin. But most people know Claritin. And then the generics for Allegra and Zyrtec, most people, I don't think would know that, but they know Allegra and Zyrtec. Yeah, I didn't know this. Like, I was like, wait, that's yeah. weird. I don't know the generic name, not the brand name. And, and the others like back and forth. forth. It's a, so I don't know per se, because there's a couple of, there's still, you know, two more exams and then a final. So I can't say definitively that there's a, never a question about like, what's the generic name for this or that. But what I can tell you is that I'll keep an eye out. And when, um, when the exams come around, I'll kind of help you guys say, make sure you know both this and this for this medication. Because I know that it's kind of a needle in a haystack kind of thing. Yeah. So just in the meantime, if it's all highlighted red, try to remember it the best you can and if something like with those second generation antihistamines like the the zyrtec and all those at least know at least know really well the allegra zyrtec claritin and then try and keep the generics in your mind too but i understand those are not nearly as easy i don't even remember the only one i remember is loratadine so i've had a prescription for it so i i understand that gets confusing yeah. Okay. So I just kind of try and keep an eye out for myself to know if I need to kind of tell you guys. Mm -hmm. But that's just nice. write it down, you know, when you're studying the names of those that's, red, yeah, just mean. write them both down and, and maybe like, they'll. It's very hard. Yeah. I know. Okay, you guys, I'm going to start going. Um, I know not everybody, <laughs> or maybe most everyone is back. Okay, we're going to talk about um, asthma and then um, COPD, which is chronic bronchitis and um, emphysema. So here's some prevalence numbers. Um, roughly 15 million Americans are affected by asthma. 5% uh, of children is pretty, um, pretty prevalent. Um, the uh, pathophysiology. So we want to really kind of, you want to look through this, kind of study this, have an understanding of this, because this will come up on quizzes and exams. So what causes the airway inflammation? Um, there's three mediators, and these are bulleted here, um, T lymphocytes and eosinophils. So these are white blood cells, um, and they're involved in the inflammatory response. Um, then we have the leukotrienes that are also inflammatory mediators. And then we have the mast cells that release the histamine in response to an allergen. So uh, people who have asthma can, an asthma attack can be triggered by an, an allergen as well. So these, these cells here are all sort of the kickoff to what um, might be happening with someone who's having an asthma attack. Um, the next thing that can happen is mucus production. Um, they can call it um, retention and plugging. So things get Mucus gets retained and, and they call it mucus plugging, like the little sacs can get plugged up with mucus. 
So that's what's starting to happen. The next we have the bronchospasm. This is mediated by um, beta two receptors. So is it um, when, when things are going wrong, is it being, is it being blocked or is it being activated? So let's go back. So use this as your, use this as your fallback always. Oh, I thought that was it. So that's where this thing comes in such handy. Is it, so we think, are they, when they're being, when, if it's working on beta two and it's being, um, Mm hmm So if beta two is doing its thing, if it's, it's doing what you want it to do, then you're going to have bronchodilation. But if something is causing um, bronchospasm to happen, then the beta two receptors are being blocked. Yeah. So just this is where this comes in so handy. It just, you can just keep falling back on it. So an asthma happens, it's being blocked? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, the bronchospasm. If you're going, if a um, person with asthma is having bronchospasm and that beta 2 receptor is being blocked. Okay, question. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just one of the things that's happening. It's just one thing that's happening in the, in the whole pathophysiology. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, if beta 2 is being activated, then you have uh, bronchodilation. So then the fourth thing in that um, stream of things that are happening is that the lung um, can hyper um, inflate. And they, another way that that's described is air trapping. So if you think about it this way, you might be like, oh, it's trapping air. That's good. Lungs want air. But if, if the air stays in there, and then there's nothing else that's happening. It's they're not getting new oxygen. They're not getting oxygenated blood. They're, everything is it's like a balloon that's blown up, and there's no in and out, in and out. It's just stuck big. So that's not a good thing. It's not a helpful thing to have your lungs be hyperinflated. Um, and then airway walls. So remodeling of the airway walls, meaning that um, you know, something is changing in the airway walls, um, not necessarily in a, in a good way. So there might be reduced elasticity or you know, some destruction of some kind. Um, so it's something, um, the structure is changing um, and that can happen with chronic, and that, um, with chronic asthma. So those are sort of the five steps that you wanna be familiar with. Um, the, media, the inflammatory mediators, uh, the mucus production, the bronchospasm, and the lung hyperinflation, and the um, airway remodeling. You said those are steps, or is that like a type of the, the asthma? That's sort of like, like what's happening in the body. Like that's a description, a very overview, basic description of what's happening in the body with an asthma attack. And that could be you know, maybe just the first couple ones are for a mild asthma attack, but, or if somebody has more chronic, severe asthma, maybe we're get down to this four and five, but that's the pathophysiology. So that's sort of like what, if we were to describe what's physically happening in the body, those are the five things that you want to know. Mm -hmm. I think it, no, cause that like remodeling and chronic asthma, that might not happen to somebody who has exercise-induced mild asthma. So I think it kind of depends on the severity. Um, okay, so what can, so risk factors are triggers. So um, allergies, exercise, stress, change in weather. Um, there was some, in the textbook here, it says that thunderstorms can trigger asthma attacks. So uh, something biometric pressure or barometer, the biometric of that could trigger it, I suppose. So all kinds of funny things. Um, upper respiratory viral infections can trigger um, somebody's asthma. So there's all sorts of um, triggers. This is important for you to know um, the stages. Um, this I think is just called intermediate in the textbook. Um, here it says mild intermediate. Um, symptoms two times a week or less, um, awakening from sleep less than twice a month. So very, so if you remember less than two, 
for intermediate, um, more than two for mild persistent, daily for moderate, and then severe, they're just constantly in this state. Always in this persistent, they're always in this state, this asthmatic state. So you're gonna wanna be familiar with this chart. Signs of asthma, wheezing, coughing, difficulty breathing. Dyspnea is another um, way of just saying uh, shortness of breath. They're just short of breath, dyspnea. Tightness in the chest. Uh, here's um, just an x-ray of somebody that's normal. And then you can see this sort of spidering kind of spider veins, it's more white kind of spread out like this. And then you can see how most looks, it's more radio uh, take in somebody who's having an asthma attack. This wasn't demonstration, This I couldn't get it to work. So you guys will have to let me know if the link is bad. Um, I don't know if it was just my computer acting funny or um, the link is bad. If um, you were a medication treating asthma, how would you work to eliminate um, an asthma attack? So what are some medications? Just thinking of things like the first thing is those inflammatory mediators, bronchoconstriction, those are all um, problems. Um, so what are some medications? If you were a medication, what would you want to do for someone having an asthma attack? Yep, dilate the, the bronchi, um, dilate the... Um, the bronchioles or whatever. And then what about inflammation? Yeah, you'd want to um, stop that overreaction of all your, all your, in, your immune system. Basically when your immune system kind of goes haywire and is like really trying to fix something, it causes inflammation. And then that can cause a disease process. So you want to tamp down that um, inflammatory process with the medication. So yeah, that's right, Jenny. And then um, if you guys, if it helps you to think about it too, like this is a process in different areas of the body. So like in our mouths, um, a lot of what causes periodontal disease destruction is just your over response, your, your immunomodulating cells that come to fight and they do too much and then it starts to destroy um, it starts to destroy the periodontium. So too much inflammation, some inflammation is necessary to keep us to kind of try and control a reaction and keep us healthy, but too much inflammation is very destructive and is not good for us at all. So anti-inflammatory um, medication or a bronchodilator, for sure, those are um, medications. So here, this is another um, one of your handout here, the study guide, this is, um, this is on the top of right underneath signs of asthma. So types of asthma medications. So we have the, um, for the, we have these three. So we have relievers that work in short term. So maybe like a rescue inhaler would be a reliever. And then we have the controllers and the preventers. And those are gonna be a little bit more long-term. So then before we go into the medications, um, because a lot of times these medications can be used in both. So we'll just go over the um, COPD um, prevalence and signs and symptoms, all that. So chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is slowly progressing disease of the airway. That's actually, it's a combination of both chronic bronchitis and emphysema. So those two things together make COPD. Um, and it's the fourth leading cause of death in the U.S. At least it was last time I updated that. I don't know if that's, it could be different now, but... Um, that was it for a while. Anyways, um, and then the etiology, most important cause, cigarette smoking. So um, it may have, maybe actually I should go and look and see if that's changed. Not as many people smoke anymore. And I don't know that vaping has the same effect in the lungs, although I can't imagine that it's healthy for your lungs at all. Um, but um, this number could have changed because less people do seem to be smoking. But most important cause is cigarette smoking accounts for um, 80 to 90% of COPD deaths. And despite the risk, one in five smokers develop COPD. 
and it's dose related. So it depends. So heavier smokers, far higher risk of COPD. My dad smoked since he, I don't know, from 14 to like 55. Um, and then he finally quit when he was in his 50s. And he did, he does have COPD, but it's very mild. Um, and when he moved to Arizona, his he was on it like he had a little inhaler. He had it enough that he needed an inhaler when they lived in Maine. Um, and then he moved to Arizona. My parents moved to Arizona and it almost all cleared up. So he's been doing really super well. And he's in his 70s um, and his lungs are pretty good, but he's lucky because he smoked for a super long time. Um, so the pathophysiology of COPD, um, again, it's uh, chronic bronchitis and emphysema. So with the bronchitis, um, you have the changes in the bronchial walls. So these two things are happening with bronchitis. You have thickening of the bronchial walls, and then you have an increase in the mucus production, increase in the size of the mucus glands, more production of mucus. There's a thickening of the walls, and then there's more junk in there. So there's just that like coughing, like constant, like bringing up of sputum. Obstruction caused by narrowing of small airways, increased sputum production, mucus plugging, and then collapse of the airways. Um, these are reasons why the breath might be obstructed altogether. Um, with emphysema, this is sort of an interesting thing that happens because when somebody smokes cigarettes, they're causing uh, injury, you know, they're, the actual like smoking process ca causes injury to the alveolar epithelium. And then when it, when it is damaged, it lets off, you know, it lets off um, sort of a, you know, like a, an enzyme or a signaling um, that attracts neutrophil. So it's kind of like, I'm damaged, you know, come. And then so your body's kind of doing this process, but the neutrophils, Sorry, not the um, not the inflammatory mediators, but the neutrophils release the enzyme, and that enzyme. So, so this is another perfect example of when your inflammatory system that's supposed to be working for your body actually starts to work against. And you see this a lot of times when inflammatory processes come. So when you when you're smoking and you've caused damage, and then your body says, "I'm damaged, come and help me." but then there's something in that same pathway. So that release of the enzymes from the neutrophils actually causes um, more, more destruction and it destroys the alveolar walls. So as a result, you have air space enlargement, you lose elasticity, and then the airways can collapse. Um, and it's just, you just can't get, you can't get air in there. You could be on oxygen, but your lungs aren't working effectively to, um, to process the oxygen. Um, okay, so here's, um, this is a little bit more detailed. You guys do not need to know this for an exam. Don't worry about it. It's just more information. This image, um, my notes here, it goes into a little more complexity um, about some of the actual um, immune system, um, the, you know, what's actually happening. Interesting to kind of understand. You don't, you're not going to be tested on it. Um, so signs and symptoms of chronic bronchitis, chronic cough, more um, sputum production. Um, patients may be sedentary. They may be overweight. They might, um, um, they used to call, they used to say, there was a term called blue bloaters because people might've been having like a blue tinge to their nails, maybe a slight blueness to their lips because they just weren't getting oxygen and they might um, have edema. So there might be swelling. Um, and so um, that was a, a term that they would describe patients um, that had chronic bronchitis, um, which to me is super scary. Like if your nails, if like your end of your extremities are starting to have a blue tinge, you are definitely not getting the oxygen that you need. Um, and then patients are often breathless. With emphysema, there's um, that shortness of breath, the dyspnea, enlarged chest. That's another term why because the chest cavity could kind of get large and that's part of what that bloating um, description had to do with as well. But then in really advanced, um, as the disease progresses, there's a lot of weight loss. Um, and in just in the, um, and then the cyanosis is usually not seen as much as with the chronic. I don't know why that would be because it seems like with either one, you're not getting oxygen. Um, 
And then so the treatment for COPD, there's no cure. Um, they just treat for symptoms, um, avoiding irritants, not smoking anymore, pharmaco um, pharmacological management. Sometimes people do go on oxygen, but we don't really talk about that in this unit at all. And then this is just some information on smoking. So um, I don't know if the numbers line up to how much cigarettes cost, but um, quitting smoking can save up almost close to $3,000 a year. It's just an expensive habit. Um, so now we'll talk about the drug therapy a little bit in the last few minutes here. So asthma and COPD share two drug um, categories. You can see both beta agonists, beta agonists for asthma and COPD, and that's the bronchodilation. So an agonist, it's doing what the drug, what that receptor does. It's not blocking it. It's doing what it does. So both for asthma and for COPD, they're gonna um, prescribe a beta agonist. Corticosteroids is for the inflammation. So both families, uh, both um, diseases, asthma and COPD, they're gonna use uh, corticosteroids. And then with asthma, there's gonna be those um, leukotriene receptor antagonists. And then with COPD, there might be some anticholinergic medications that are used. So there's a little bit of differentiation, but those first two are the same for both because they're working to um, open things up and reduce inflammation. So here we have, these are beta agonists. Um, these are in red, so important to remember. Albuterol is short acting. This is like your rescue inhaler, um, albuterol. Then we have the um, salmeterol or the cerevent. This is a long acting and it's more for maintenance. And then we have this other one here from Moderol. Is another one. Short-acting or long-acting? Does that mean like your medications you take in like just once in a while? Or yeah, like, like rescue acid? inhaler. If you use it, um, it might only work for I don't know half an hour or a couple. I don't know how long it would work, but the other one might work for six to eight hours or oh. something like that. You might only have to do it once a day, whereas a rescue inhaler you might have to do it after you exercise. You know, like it would just be. Um, intermittent, maybe. Um, so with the beta agonist, it acts on the beta 2 receptors. It dilates, because that's what, if the receptor is doing what it's going to do, then it will dilate. Most effective, um, it's the most effective bronchodilator. Duration, it can either be short or long acting. And then the onset can be minutes if it's a rescue inhaler, or it can take hours if it's a longer, slower acting one. The adverse effects for a beta agonist is going to be xerostomia is a big one, um, increased heart rate, nervousness, tremors, um, and that can be more with the short acting, um, the short acting uh, medications. So just remembering xerostomia is probably a big one to remember for the beta agonists. Corticosteroids, um, these are more for maintenance. So they're more of a controller. So this is these are going to last longer. You'll use these if you're um, more have you know more consistently dealing with asthma problems, or if you have the um, COPD mechanism, it blocks the um, inflammatory response, and you can have different potencies, um, either low, medium, or high. So they can adjust the doses of the corticosteroid needs. Big star, star, star by oral thrush. Corticosteroids um, are going to increase a patient's likelihood of having um, thrush, oral thrush. That's what this is. I could get a real one. I should put a real one in there. They have these things, and we talk about these a little bit in special needs. This is called a spacer. And basically, this hooks up to your inhaler. Um, and then you put the, this goes up to the patient's mask. And this space, you Put the medication in that space and then you breathe it all in real fast and what it does is it prevents it from like lingering in your mouth and it just gets it like it shoots it into your lungs a lot more effectively so these spacers are oftentimes given to people to use instead of but i i've never seen anyone use it probably maybe people have them at home but when i see people bringing them they just have their rescue inhalers but this would be more important is if you were using an inhaler daily, 
then you would want to make sure that um, that you had something like that to prevent, um, especially the the oral side effects. So systemic tablets of corticosteroids, um, they're short term. Um, side effects such as insomnia, nervousness, increased appetite, impaired glucose. Long-term, there's a lot of pretty nasty long-term effects with corticosteroids if they're in a higher dose. Um, there's, um, it, this, all of these symptoms go along with Cushing's disease, which is another thing we look at. They're similar to Cushing's disease. And it's just all these effects of taking too much um, and corticosteroid medication. Um, and you just get all these negative side effects. And we won't really go into them because you don't really need to know them for this class, but we talk a little bit more about them in special needs. Um, Cause there's some people who, because of their different diseases, they're on a high dose of corticosteroids um, every day. Um, okay, so inhaled corticosteroids, Flovent or um, fluticasone with long acting, and that is just a steroid only, but then notice Advair and Simbacort, which are names like I've been more familiar with and heard. So they're both, they're also long acting, but note that they're a combination of steroid and beta two. So that's important to, to note. Um, uh, I don't, I probably should have highlighted it. You could have a question on that. Like which, you know, which of these medications is a combo? Um, inhaled corticosteroids. So it has both a beta agonist and a corticosteroid. And leukotriene receptor antagonists. So these are blocking leukotriene receptors. These are to treat asthma. The mechanism is to block the receptors, like I said. Adverse effects are headache. Singular um, is a common one. So that's um, a medication to just remember. Singular is a leukotriene receptor antagonist. Blocks Anticholinergic oral inhalation. So blocks the cholinergic receptors in the smooth muscle, um, which results in bronchodilation. Um, the adverse effects, there's low anticholinergic effects, which is good. So there's not a bunch, you don't see like xerostomia noted here. You don't see like dry eyes noted here. So it's low anticholinergic effects. There can be some nausea and occasional metallic um, taste. We have atrovan and um, uh, spirivia. I haven't, maybe atrovan I've seen, but I haven't seen these medications very much in practice, but these are, I was looking to see short acting and long acting. So, so yeah, okay, that's different. So that's important. So these are sh um, short acting, but notice they're not in red. So they're probably not gonna show up on an exam. So that's, you know. And then, oh, this is the one that I changed that I just missed it in the other ones. Okay, so you can just apply the same thing. So MOA is mechanism of action. Um, so here's just another thing. These are the more important ones that could end up on a, an exam or a quiz for you. So make sure you know the mechanism of action and the adverse effects of those medications. There's a, just an example for you. All right. So uh, patient with moderate persistent asthma and allergic rhinitis, Current medication, they're um, taking Centrum daily, which is a vitamin, loratadine daily, um, Advair twice a day, um, and um, albuterol once in a while. Symptoms, they're getting a white buildup lining in the upper palate, the tongue and the back of the throat, and they can remove it with gauze. So what's the white buildup in the patient's mouth? Rush, you guys said that with confidence. What might be causing it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, the um, corticosteroid, the inhaled corticosteroid. And then, um, and which of, uh, do you guys remember which one of these would be the, so they're taking the flut, um, fluticasone or the Advair or this prevent albuterol, which one, um, do you remember which one has the corticosteroid? Um, Advair. Advair has the corticosteroid. And then, um, mm -hmm, yep. 
And how can you counsel the patient to prevent or minimize it from happening? How, what might you recommend if they have rush? What might you recommend to prevent that? The spacer, yeah, good job. Yep, yep, yep. The spacer. Um, yes, to clear, yep, to flush it out. That's another good suggestion. Yeah, exactly. Um, flush it out with water. Patient with asthma started running three to four times a week. Symptoms, I don't know why there's a question mark. Um, shortness of breath, likely out of, uh, I have, this is not written well. What is it even saying? Symptoms, soon shortness of breath, likely out of shape, current meds. Um, so they're taking Advair, um, Albuterol, Synthroid for their thyroid. Advair took more um, but there was no relief. So they took more Advil to Advair to try and relieve their shortness of breath. So what might be causing their symptoms? It could just be exercise induced. I don't like this one. <laughs> I'm getting rid of this one. We're going to rewrite it, but it could be exercise induced asthma. That could be it. Um, and what might help them with that? Like a rescue inhaler? Yeah, that might help. Despite receiving a higher dose of Advair, why is it not effectively controlling the shortness of breath during exercise? Let's go back real quick because I think this will help us. No, it is a beta two agonist. Hmm. I think it's probably that they just need a. Uh, I think the point that they're trying to get to is that it's uh, they need a rescue inhaler. Short acting of the provincial albuterol, but they have the albuterol. Oh, it's expired. Is that what it said? Oh, okay. That's probably what it is then. I don't like that one. I'm going to rewrite it. Okay. So that is that. That's a whole heck of a lot of stuff to remember. So I have it recorded. I will upload it onto Moodle. Um, use the, use the um, study guides to help you guys organize all of that information. And remember, focus on things that are highlighted in red and highlighted in yellow. Those are going to be things that you're going to want to focus on. And I will see you guys later Thursday. I'll see you guys in cariology later today. Mm -hmm, you're welcome.